Chapter 5 Sebastian How can I continue with Zoe the way it is? Her life and my life is at stake. I should have told her when I followed her into that bar. But she had never gone to a bar or placed herself in danger before. All she did was stay in the house and go to school. I could watch her at school and at home without her seeing me. I'd follow her to her evening classes and sit in the back row among hundreds in a lecture hall. She had few friends and no boyfriend she liked. That was a relief to me. It made it easy for me because I didn't trust any man with her, because I didn't want to share her. Not now. Not ever. When I spotted Detective Cole trailing her, I thought it was him being curious and protective. But I recognized an obsession because I was obsessed with her, and in love with her. She was vulnerable and warm and giving. She gave me the happiness I never hoped to experience. As the years passed Cole stopped trailing her and parking in front of her house at night. I was relieved because I thought he would call attention to Zoe, and perhaps that's how they found her. When she decided to go out that night with her friend, I wasn't expecting to see R. As usual, he put up a good fight, but he was never as strong as I was because he was much younger than I. As I pulled a wooden spike from my jacket ready to thrust it into his heart, he read my face and my intentions to kill him. He decided he would fight another day. He left with blood on his lips and anger and spite in his cold heart for me. I waited too long to show myself to Zoe. But it's still too soon to tell her everything. If we are to leave Seattle, then I have to feed tonight. It's becoming more and more difficult trying to stay away from her. She's warm and her body is so appealing. I can smell her and taste her blood in my mouth. I need her warmth and yet I don't dare get close to her. Her smell is too alluring. I can see her now and feel her. I can't get away from her, but one day I will have to do just that because if I fall in love with her, I will have to kill her or change her into a vampire. I can't keep reminding myself of how much I desire her. I might be tempted to feed on her, and I don't want to do that. She's the only one standing between me and my humanity. Leaving Zoe in the house so I can feed wasn't a problem before because she was unconscious, but now I'm afraid to leave her for even a short time. I will have to capture a large deer so I can feed and satisfy my thirst for a longer period of time. I look up, and the large elk is standing in front of me. He has no notion that I am hunting him. There he is. I knew I would find him drinking at the river. I've been chasing you for months, I murmured to the stately creature I'm about to kill. I creep behind him. I could spring up and catch him, but I want him to know he's being hunted. I need to give him a chance to run. To feel as if he's in control, when in fact, I control the dark universe. I have dominion over life and death. The elk didn't hear me coming. Was he concentrating on something else? He raises his head because he senses danger. He can't smell me because I have no scent that he is familiar with. This beautiful animal reminds me that I have to keep vigilant. This deer is distracted by his need to mate. He doesn't realize that his life is coming to an end, and in that way he is admired by me. For a moment, I hesitate because I'm tired of killing. I watch him and he relaxes, and my instincts are reinforced by my hunger. It's too late now. He lets his guard down, I pounce on him and my fangs drop and break through flesh and the blood is flowing in me, and now he's dead. I killed it with one thrust into his vein, and he crumpled to the ground. His heart is still beating but not for long. Holding him I feel his fear, I feel his longing for life, and I feel his despair when he releases his last breath. Crouching on the ground I'm gazing at his lifeless body, which strengthens my respect for life. But not my own anymore. That's over. It's the life of Zoe that I'm trying to protect. I placed my teeth on his neck, 
and plunged the points of my fangs into his vein once more. The warmth of his blood flowing in my mouth has a bitter taste. Zoe's blood is sweet, I thought. The deer's blood is nourishing, and I take comfort that his blood is keeping me strong. I've been reborn from taking a life. I raised my head and blew out a full breath. One last ounce of his blood should satisfy my thirst and keep me strong for a week. Not as nourishing as taking it from a human, but that's why I separated from my family, so I could live like a man, and not a cold-hearted animal. Raising my head with blood dripping down my short beard, I murmured, I'm not like my brothers or my father. I don't have to feed on humans. Had I misled myself into thinking I was different from them? But you are. Don't you know that? I jerked my head around. I recognized the voice. It's another one of my many brothers, R, but the most dangerous one to me. How had he found me? I guess that wasn't hard. This is the closest place that has wildlife. He stood over me, my knees planted on the ground, blood dripping from my mouth onto my sleeve. I unconsciously wiped my mouth, as if I were a human, and didn't have a napkin to catch the bits and pieces of food I may have eaten too hurriedly. I looked like the animal I had become, the one I didn't want to be. I'm on the low ground, and I'm at a disadvantage. Now I'm like the elk that I had just slaughtered. The very thing I scold the deer for, I fell into. My mind not concentrating, my senses full of the smell of Zoe's scent, arousing me, distracting me from engaging the dangers surrounding me. R stepped in front of the animal. His eyes lowered. He possessed the greed of a human who could never be satisfied by money, love or food. Let's not let a meal go to waste, he said. Then he stooped crouching down in front of me to the right of the elk's neck, with his eyes never leaving his focus, me. He's totally concentrated on my every movement. He opens his mouth, his young fangs protruding. When I left my father's home, he was a teenager like Zoe. He worshipped me, and he thought I would be the one to change him. But he was always a destructive boy. Always a destructive child. All he enjoyed doing was killing things. I made the mistake of taking him to the fair with me and Zoe, and three children went missing that very night. He swore to mother that he didn't do it, but I knew he had because he loved to take souvenirs. I found dolls and a watch in his bedroom soon after. I knew one day he would either kill Zoe or turn her. R took a bite and raised his head and his cold eyes glared at me. How can you stand to eat this, he said still watching me. Still sizing me up. Still feeding on the animal's blood. I have no taste for human blood any longer, I said to him, expecting a response but none came, and even though he detested the blood of animals, his greed was insatiable, and he didn't stop until not a drop of its blood remained. The animal lay, its body only a few minutes ago a splendid animal, now, a dried-up carcass. That's how I envisioned Zoe, if R ever got his teeth into her. Her blood smelled of youth and so sweet, that he would feed until nothing was left of her. I could never allow him to do that to her. Trying to find the good in him where he wouldn't pose a threat to Zoe, I tried reasoning with him. You don't have to be like you are. With a little self-control, you can be a vampire like me. If you want, I said eager to convince him of my newfound preference and the freedom from the nightmares of having to live with all the souls I've consumed in my hundreds of years of being a vampire. But I don't want to be like you, he said with a teasing tone. Once you did. Don't you remember? I asked looking into his face. His expression changed to one of sadness. Perhaps for that second he saw what was possible. His fiery red eyes jolted to me. I enjoy the pleasure that warm blood from a human brings me, he said with an irritated voice. It makes me strong to know I can take a living human in my hands with its warmth, his eyes fell to his hands, and suck the life from them and make them cold like me. 
He raised his hands as if he was holding the neck of a person, and a smile crept across his face. His eyes lit up, and his inhumanity was never as overriding as it is now. I enjoy my death. I enjoy killing and savoring the blood of my victims. I can have all the women I've ever wanted forever, and when I'm finished with them, then I can feed on their bodies. Some I let live, some I turn, and some I just discard like trash. He opened his hands and waved them to his side. His expression unchanged. It was like looking at a piece of concrete with eyes. Now where is our sister? He said with a huff. Mother wants her back and father is beside himself because you've killed one of our brothers and you have disobeyed him, R said with a smirk. R never liked that brother who tried to molest and turn Zoe when she was a child. If I hadn't heard Zoe screaming and killed him on the spot, he would have harmed her later. And as for R, he would have killed him himself because he had his eyes on Zoe too. Father demanded that I bring you back to him. He said not to return without you. Do you see what I mean? I can't go back unless you're with me. His voice is calm. But R is most dangerous when he's calm. You could go to him and say you couldn't find me, and he would stop looking. Why would I do that? R said standing. I just want to live like a human again. But you aren't a human, and you will never be that again. Even if the world comes to an end, there you will be all alone, and the human females who fall in love with you will die, or you will consume them or try to save them by making them immortal, and you will still be what you are, a vampire who roams at night and turns everything into lifeless dead creatures. It was painful to hear. I'm going to marry Zoe, I said out of anger and truth. I didn't want to hear anything from him. I didn't want to have my brutality laid bare before me, where I would have to accept who I am. I had been running from that since Zoe came into my life. What do you know about love or marriage? He said. I know that even now as a vampire, I still have a soul because I'm still able to feel emotion. I'm becoming less of a monster because I no longer feed on human blood. And I know Zoe is in love with me. Does she know what you are? Of course not, he said answering his own question. She never knew what we were when father kidnapped her on her way to school. Mother saw this little innocent creature, and she wanted something to play with. She wanted what she couldn't have. A human child. Something inside her longed to be human like you're doing now. Father would do anything for mother then, their love was still young and strong for each other, but after a thousand years together he was just operating on instinct. Then he brought Zoe home, and me, and then you and I had a sister to play with. Why didn't you release me with Zoe? I wouldn't be here now, tracking you to this god-awful place. I didn't release you because I knew you wanted to be what you are. You're a killer, and you were going to kill Zoe one day. R shifted his head to the right. He shot me a closed smile, as if to acknowledge that I had been right all along. He would have either killed her or turned her. I haven't revealed anything to Zoe, because I wiped her memory before I released her. I'm going to tell her everything. I'm going to ask her to marry me, I said breathlessly. Do you hear yourself? He raised the broken neck of the deer, took a bite, and threw the body into a tree. There was nothing standing between me and R. I guess you can get to like anything, he said. Acquired taste, I suppose. Why don't you just turn her? and have her serve you for eternity. I can't do that. If you could see how beautiful and warm she is, then you wouldn't want to harm her. She was a child, and now she's a woman, I said to him, trying to ignite some feeling of empathy for Zoe, who was then his sister. But there was no light in his eyes. He was as cold as the day he was turned when he became eighteen. I should have known better, R is a born killer. I saw it when he was young, when father first brought him to live with us. 
he killed Zoe's cat, and he began killing all the little animals and some children where we lived. It was because of him, we had to constantly move about. R became quiet, as if he was wondering what to do with me. I didn't want to have a confrontation with him. I needed to get back to Zoe. She needed me more now than ever. I quickly turned and bolted down the path, but I wasn't as fast as R. The blood of humans gives you inhuman strength. The blood of animals gives you only strength to exist. He stood in front of me with a grin. Where do you think you're going? I was always faster than you. Do you think you can outrun me? My hands balled into a quick fist, and I rammed it into his chest and it threw him backward, and I started to run once more. I needed to get back to Zoe, before more of my family discovered my safe haven. He caught me. Do you think that little blow will stop me? But this will. He carried something in his hand, and threw it at me. It was a ball of silver net, with a wooden handle, which unraveled as he threw it in my direction. It dropped over me burning my hands, as I held them over my head, to protect my hair, and to lessen the umbrella effect of covering and burning me completely. My hands threw it off, and I rushed away leaving R to deal with the blow I had dealt him. He didn't look like he was coping well with the shock to his chest. If I wanted, I could have reduced him to nothing, but I couldn't because I still thought of him as a brother and my little human brother. That was my humanity, and it may prove to be the end of me. Chapter 6 Sebastian When I arrived at the house the moon was still out, but the chill and dew of morning had settled on the grass and trees. The sun would be returning soon. This place had been perfect for me, and now I would have to change locations, because sooner or later R would discover my whereabouts if he didn't already know. I stood at the foot of Zoe's bed, and she was still sleeping. I turned to walk away, satisfied that she's okay. Where have you been? She said in a small voice. I spun around to face her and walked to her bed. She watched at me with an innocent smile, which reminds me of when she was five. Where have you been? You look like you've been in a slaughterhouse. Glancing down, blood covered my shirt, and dry blood mixed with dirt smeared on my pant legs appeared to be just that. I could have been in a slaughterhouse. It wasn't too far from the truth, so I gave her some of the truth. Hunting. I like to eat deer meat, and I have this camp where I make sausage and cut the meat up for later. She stared at me as if she didn't believe me, but not saying a word. Next time try not to burn yourself. My eyes fell on my hands, but they were healing as she spoke. I cupped them behind my back. I pivoted around, happy I had distracted her, and she didn't ask too many questions. Tomorrow, I have to see my father. I need him to know that I'm alive and to tell Detective Cole that he shouldn't look for me, Zoe said. Have you accepted that I can protect you from my family? No. I'm not fully convinced. Her eyes flashing to me. Her long lashes covering the bluest of eyes. You cannot see your father, I said, my voice demanding and urgent. I strode to the bed and sat near her. Her eyes glowed with anger. Why not? I've agreed to go with you, a stranger, and put my life in your hands, and you can't allow me to have one day with my father? What if someone tracks you to your father's home? You will be putting him in danger, and he could die as a result of your childish desires. She twirled a strand of hair as she did when she was a child. Her gaze turned to me. You know something you haven't told me. She narrowed her eyes. I turned away from her gaze to prevent her from reading me. What good would it do to tell you? You won't understand, I said to her. How about trying to make me understand? Because you're just a... A woman. That's not what I wanted to say. I have to get some sleep, and I need you to stay in the house while I get some sleep. 
She crossed her arms, and I thought I could rest because there was sure to be a retaliation from R. He wasn't the type to let this go, and this time, he would bring someone with him to help capture me. When I left to go into my chamber, Zoe was pouting but roaming around the house. Maybe I should get her a widescreen television and stream movies to keep her entertained. I understand young women like those things. Maybe take her shopping. I amused myself with thoughts of doing some human things as I fell into a deep sleep. I woke, and the darkness had surrounded me with thoughts that something had gone wrong. I didn't hear Zoe's heartbeat. I didn't smell her scent. I sat up. She wasn't here. How had I managed to sleep all day and part of the night? Never had I permitted myself to do that. Knowing I was forever hunted, I allowed myself an hour of sleep during the day, even if I remained in my chamber hidden away in the walls. I stood looked around and searched for a sound, and rushed to where Zoe had been sleeping, and she wasn't there. Where had she gone I questioned myself. And it came to me, to her father's home. For seven years, I had hidden in the shadows never revealing myself. Hunting in the forests and parks surrounding Seattle never leaving her side, and now she has put both of us and her father into untold danger and everyone in his neighborhood. I had my fill of the elk, and I wouldn't be hungry for a few days. Because I wasn't around Zoe and covering her scent, R would soon find her. I wasted no time in getting to her. When I stood at her doorsteps, I could see through the picture window into her home. She was sitting at the fire in a chair across from her father. Her father had been reading, and he held a book on the blanket which covered his legs. He leaned forward, and then sat back with an uneasy tightness in his body, as if Zoe had given him bad news. Then I realized she probably told him she had to go away. When Zoe looked up, I was standing in the dining area. You should lock your doors, I said looking at a startled Zoe and her father. What are you doing in my house, her father asked. A youthful-looking man with worry lines dotting his face and a full head of white hair. When he tried to stand, the youthful face belied the age of his body. His reflexes slow and his knees weak. His body showed the wear and tear of working out in harsh weather. His face showed many sleepless nights with large bags settling under his eyes. I came for Zoe. I looked at her. It's not safe here. I think she understood. I had warned her and she disobeyed my wishes. But she just got here. I worried myself about what had become of her. Just like when she was a child, and now you've come again to take her from me. I came to protect her, not take her from you. I would never do that, I said. He sat back, his face smooth with relief. When will I see her again? Her father asked. Zoe stood and walked near her father, and leaned down and kissed him on the forehead. She sensed that she had to leave with me. Do you understand that she will never be safe in your home? She may never be able to visit you again. He ignored my plea, and Zoe's eyes wandered from her father to me. Zoe's father turned on the television, as if that would drown out his thoughts, and the memory of her disappearing on her way to school. It had been his job to see that she got to school, and because he was sleepy from working all night, he let a bright little girl convince him that she could walk to school alone. For that he blamed himself, and caused resentment between him and Zoe's mother. But he wouldn't know that he was dealing with a force much greater than just a sleepy inattentive father. Nothing would have prevented my father from kidnapping Zoe. I looked away to the television. The nightly news was reporting on a series of murders. I recognized the lake house where I had hidden Zoe. The news reporter and cameraman panned to a shot of two people lying on the floor of their home. A blood trail leading from the upper bedroom down to the foot of the stairs and ended with the death of their dog. There are no footprints. Just blood everywhere, 
the police chief said to Detective Cole who paced around out of camera range. Then back again into frame, as he kneeled to examine the woman's neck, and then he said, there are two bites on her neck. And then he stood and kneeled beside the man and checked his neck. The same kind of bites here, he said into the camera. And the dog too, the sheriff asked. I turned to Zoe, as she watched at the television with her father. We have to leave now. Your father will have to come with us. I'm not going anywhere, Zoe's father said. I handed Zoe my hand. She glanced at her father. Please come with us. Sebastian will take care of us, she said to him. This is my home, and this is where your mother died and I'm staying here, he said to Zoe as she rushed to his lap holding him and he held her. She stood looking sad. Take care of yourself, father, she said with tears welling in her eyes and then streaming down her cheeks. Where is the car you took? We need it to get away from here now and it has our passports. I hid it in my father's garage. You said passports? She led the way through the kitchen looking back, hoping her father changed his mind. We stood out back and I raised the door to the garage. It had no automatic door opener. That wasn't a worry. I could raise it with my finger or just looking at it, but I didn't want to frighten Zoe. She had been through enough. She hopped into the Land Rover and I started it and backed out. I jumped out of the car and pulled the door down. When we were on the highway headed out of town, she asked me, what next and where are we going? I had scouted out a place just for this occasion. We're going to Canada. Why Canada? Don't we need passports? I have them in here. They're in the car. I reached for them and handed one to her. You think of everything. Well, have you thought that I don't want to be with you? You don't have to be with me. But you do have to live with me. Isn't that the same thing? She asked her eyes fading on me and then turning looking out the window into the night. We will have to act like a couple. You don't have to be in love with me, but you do have to pretend we're married. She glanced at me with a furrowed brow. Why would I marry someone like you? You have no warmth. You don't have a personality. You don't laugh and from what I've seen of you and it isn't much, you have no sense of humor. And besides you're a night person and I'm a day person, and if you think you're going to keep me in prison while you sleep all day, you can go fuck yourself. I don't curse. It's a nasty habit. She eyed me. But I do, she said with a huff and crossed her arms over her chest. I guess adding cursing to all your nasty habits would be too much for even you. I shook my head and didn't respond. She was looking for a fight. That's why they say opposites attract. I smiled trying to dispel her notions of me. Now can you at least accept this situation for now? And another thing, I'm not eating that deer meat. You don't have to. There will be enough for me. I said glancing at her with a smirk. You don't look very prosperous, except for this SUV. Did you steal it and that house? Is that all you want me for, my money? If I can't have anything else, I guess settling for money would be nice. Do you mean that you aren't attracted to me? You are handsome and you're tall. You have a nice nose and a hard body and ass, but aside from that you are just a pretty box with ribbons and bows and nothing inside. She didn't know just how true that was. I couldn't answer her, because I had nothing to counteract what she had just said. I kept my eyes up front and somehow she felt my pain. I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. I say things when I'm hurt. I know. You were like that when you were a child. Her eyes shot to me and she turned. How do you know that? What part did you play in my disappearance? None. 
She sat back and relaxed because she did want to believe me. But I had played a great part. I didn't have to wait until she was 15 before I took her away from my mother, father, and brothers. It was just that I loved her from the time I met her. First as a sister, and then as someone I wanted to protect. And now, as a woman, I fell in love with.